am speaking to a group of people who are literally scattered around the world. And that's a wonderful thing as we look at God's people and think about God's people. And today I'd like to begin with a brief look at a little piece of American history. Uh, It's actually the founding of a settlement uh, in what was called the New World that would eventually grow into a colony. It would eventually become a state or the state of Virginia. And it's where the United States considers its beginning, its roots with that first colony that was, that first settlement that was established. In 1606, a joint stock company, which was known as the Virginia Company of London, received a charter from King James I to establish a new settlement in the New World. Now, this settlement was established as a commercial enterprise. Uh, It became a colony and a state, as I mentioned, but it was a different beginning than, say, the state of Pennsylvania or the state of Rhode Island, which which were established for religious freedom. People fled there for religious freedom. This was a commercial enterprise to take a foothold there and begin to do commerce. Now, the following year in 1607, the site was selected in the New World, and it was named Jamestown. It was located on the James River, all in honor of the King of England. Uh, The site was a wooded area, and it would be protected from the Indians and from the Spaniards, which were the enemies of that particular time period. did have a problem, though. It was... uh, infested with mosquitoes, and quite frankly, the uh, malaria became a problem. Now, when that group of people came, which had a varied uh, background, uh, England sent uh, weapons, food, and men, really in ample supply. And of that group who came over, there were men and women, but among the men were skilled craftsmen. Uh, There were some laborers, and there were some gentlemen of the aristocracy. Uh, Most of them had a rural background from cities such as London. And when they arrived, uh, the rivers had fish in them. We may say the rivers flopped with fish. Uh, There were, uh, in the wintertime, ducks and geese would be on the rivers. Uh, The woods had game that were there. The Indians grew corn. Yet in the early years of that Jamestown settlement, it proved to be a nightmare for those settlers. Hundreds of people died from disease. Hundreds of people died from actual, and people died from actual starvation. The years between 1609 and 1610 was known as the starving time. And out of 500 settlers, only about 80, about 20 percent made it, or about 80 percent died. Now, let me quote to you from the book, American Slavery, American Freedom, by Edmund S. Morgan. Quoting at this time, Jamestown was filled with the best and the worst of England. It consisted of many skilled craftsmen of the middle class. Uh, There were carpenters, there were uh, apothecary, there were candle makers, there were perfumers, there were blacksmiths. All types of talented, skilled laborers were among the group that came. When the new world, with its promise of hope, proved to be different from what was expected, many failed to adapt. Carpenters, they wouldn't plant. Uh, The skilled labor, some of them wouldn't learn a new skill. The coopers wouldn't do anything but make barrels. And the aristocracy or the gentlemen, they felt they were there to give wisdom. To quote once again, many many failed to change into what would take to what it would take to be a success in the new world. Those who did change picked up new skills and did make it. They became the strength of the new world and the seeds of the greatest nation on earth. Now let's, or allow me to transition to our calling. Our calling and our opportunity because we have all entered into something new when we came into the truth of God and into the fellowship of the church. You and I have been called to be a part of something greater than just ourselves. We look now, looking back to Jamestown 400 years later, you and I have been given the opportunity to become a part of a new life, a new way of thinking, a new approach to life, 
That is to be one of a group of people who God calls his elect. Now turn with me to John chapter 15. And let's look there, John. John 15, let's begin in verse 14. This is Christ's own words, and he says, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and hear and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. As an individual, we have been chosen specifically and specially by God. He has chosen us to be a part of a group. Now, we're not talked down to, as Christ says right here. I don't talk to you. This is some of his last teachings before his life ended. Uh, He didn't talk down to them as a group. He talked to them as brothers, as friends. He talked to them that information was shared with them because now as that establishment of the New Testament church began, uh, they would be a group which were in the know, if I might put it that way, shared information by Jesus Christ at that time and then through his or through the Spirit of God later. Now notice in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and let's look at verse 19. Again, Christ's words. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So with this unique calling of John 15, we see now there is a group. There is a group that is now banded together through the Spirit of God. And as a group, we have been chosen to set an example of Christian behavior, and we are to teach and educate the world on the things of God. And those whom God would call, we were to baptize and and work with them. Now, I do have a question. Who can God use to do his work? There is a calling that goes out, but who can God use to do his work? I believe that's a critical question. Who? Now, as a group, for example, if we look at our ordained ministry, our full-time ordained ministry, I believe you would find that there is a variety of talents and abilities among that group of ministers. The roots and the background of the individual ministers is quite varied. Now, that's true. Same thing is true of the members. But among the the ministry, you will find that they have things that are shared. They're ordained into the ministry. They have God's Spirit. They are called upon to teach. They're called upon to counsel. And that's kind of the the common thing that they share among themselves. It has to do with what they're called to do. But as individuals, just among the full-time ministers, we have individuals who are, in my view, quite talented, some of whom are quite talented. We have writers. We have some very gifted preachers or speakers within the church. We have those who can do research. We have those who are quite gifted in the realm of computers and IT. We have singers, electricians, plumbers, artists, musicians, and engineers. And that's all within the full-time ministry of the church. Now, if you expand that to the eldership of the church, I believe that even makes it a wider group of varying talents. And if you look among the membership, There is such a variety of talent and ability among the membership. Uh, We have individuals who are just multi-talented. Among the whole group, there may be some who are less talented, but some are extremely talented, but all are called to achieve the same end product. Regardless of our background, regardless of our talents, we're all called to achieve the exact same end product or in product. Now, who is it 
who God can use to do his work. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66, and then we'll begin in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, heaven and earth is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? For all these things my hand has made. All these things exist, says the Lord, but on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word. Now let me give another translation of verse 2, the contemporary English version. I have made everything, and that's how it all came to be. I, the Lord, have spoken. The people I treasure most are humble. They depend only on me and tremble when I speak. Bible in basic English says, but to this man only will I give attention. So who can God use to do his work for us? It is the individual who is humble. It is the person who will listen to God, the person who will change into the type of individual that God is looking for to answer his call and to do his work. Uh, Back or over in the New Testament in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20 and then verse 16. Matthew 20 and verse 16 says, so the last will be first and the first last, for many were called, but few are chosen. Now, that statement, many are called, but few are chosen, it's the last line of what, quite frankly, is a revealing parable, illustrating how God views our calling and what God expects of us. The parable tells of how individuals were hired to do a work in the field. They were hired for, says a denarius, let's call it a dollar, to work all day. And that was, they were happy to have that. They were going to work all day. And then at the end of the work shift, at the end of the day, here was someone else who was hired, only worked an hour. And here's the account. If you'll notice in verse uh, 10, Matthew 20, and then verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more or more money. And they likewise received each a denarius, or let's call it a dollar. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Boy, sounds unfair. Verse 13. But he who answered one of them said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me to work for a dollar? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Verse 15, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first. The first will be last. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, brethren, that quite frankly should really ring in our ears as we continue with our tenure within the church, the body of Christ, as we go forward. The call goes out. We don't give the call. The call comes from God to bring them to his son. Those who answer the call are given the opportunity to do the work. But not all adapt to the conditions of the great God. Not everyone responds to that calling. Now, sometimes, as we look at our role in the church, everything doesn't always seem fair once we're called into the fellowship of the church and we commence or begin the work of God. Does it? Does it always seem fair? To go back to the scenario of Jamestown, what a carpenter is expected to plant A cooper is expected to make things other than a barrel. A common laborer is to learn a new trade. A gentleman is to learn to work with his hands. These are demands. These are changes. This is something different. Is that what I'm called to do? Sometimes the 
appearance of unfairness is demonstrated when we don't get to do all that we think we have the talent to do, or maybe we do have that talent, but we don't have that sometimes the opportunity to accomplish what we feel we can. But all in good time, all in good time. Now, is there anyone among us, be it member or minister alike, who can say from their own personal experience and uh, perspective that they have not been made to learn new skills in the work of the church? I think the answer is, you bet. We've all been called to do things that maybe we haven't been done before, to stretch our comfort level, uh, to do something for the good of the whole. How many men do we have who are giving sermonettes who would say, I never envisioned that I would stand up and speak publicly? Or we have the introvert who's the door greeter to meet everyone who comes to church, or the individual has no background in sound technology and they run our sound system, or the song leader. How many have now been put into positions that heretofore they never thought they would ever be called to do that? I remember years ago, it's probably now nine or ten years ago, when the Church of God, a worldwide association, began. And my son, he was uh, about 23 or so. He's in graduate school living at home, and he knew on a firsthand uh, basis what that was like for us in the ministry. I was a church pastor at the time. And he came to me and he said, Dad, he said, "Uh, I'll do anything that you need to be done in the church to help out. You know, I I help with sound, and he didn't have the technical background for sound or a running cable, uh, helping with widows, uh, pass out, whatever it was he was willing to do. But he said the following, and I won't forget it. He said, Dad, just please never ask me to be a song leader. I'll do anything, but I don't want to lead songs. I just don't want. I said, okay, son. We got about two months into our new beginning, And as I looked out among the congregation, guess what we needed? We needed a song leader. So I came back to him and I said, I want to mention a need that we have. We have a need for a song leader. Now, to his credit, he didn't say, what? Did you forget what I just told you two months ago? Uh, You didn't realize what I said? Now, I didn't ask him to be a song leader. I said, we have the need for a song leader. And he looked at me and said, okay, Dad, I'll learn. And uh, he, he didn't want to be a song leader. My point is being, how many of you have been in that exact same situation? Called upon to expand beyond your comfort level to do something for the good of the church. Men and women alike, we've all been called on to do that. Now, notice in Matthew 13, Matthew 13 and begin in verse 18. Matthew 13, verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. Verse 20. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And now verse 22. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he, in verse 23, but he who receives seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit, produces some 100-fold, some 60, and some 30. When you look at verse 23, And I believe this is the audience to whom I'm addressing that scripture and that that scripture applies. To hear, to understand, and then to produce. To produce the type of fruit that God expects takes a humble, pliable, malleable Christian. 
a Christian who will do whatever is required of him or her, whatever it takes, whatever opportunity, whatever challenge, they take that with God's Spirit and they go forward and they produce fruit. Now, you and I are called to worship our God in sincerity and truth. That's what I'll call, that's the baseline. That's what we are called to do. However, once we're called and we respond to God in sincerity and in truth, then comes the challenges. Blessings and opportunity that may be unique to the individual member. There are challenges, there are blessings. But once we respond in sincerity and truth, then that life begins a new dimension. There are new things placed upon us that we have to react to. You know, some people can't handle blessings. Some people can't handle difficulties or trials or stress. Now, we need to keep into perspective that God is doing a great work through his church. At the same time, he is preparing a people to rule with him in the world tomorrow. God's eye is not only on the present. God's eye is also on the future. You and I tend to live in the present, but we have to keep our eye on the future and defer to what God has in mind for each, each one of us. As a result of God's calling us, our answering that calling of the great God, a foundation has been laid. The overall structure of the church has been set. It has been set in Scripture. It has been set in this modern era of the church. A structure has been set. A framework has been laid. Now, that structure is there to accomplish the work that God has in mind for the church. That's what's been framed. And you and I have been set within the body of Christ as it has pleased the Father, to fit within that structure, whichever corner of the structure, top, middle, bottom, side, left uh, uh, quartile, or the bottom right, whatever it is, we're set there as God has pleased. Now, you and I are both aware that God has called into his church of people with a vast different background, such a different background, but all for the same purpose. We are to be a part of his church to do the work that is set before us, especially this being an international uh, Sabbath service today. It's just underscored by the fact we're scattered across the world, different backgrounds, different societies, different opportunities, different challenges, but all called to do the same thing. I'd like to give an example about a, a quilt Now, in the southeast portion of the United States, uh, middle Atlantic southeast portion, it's called Appalachia. And one of the things they're known for are their beautiful handmade quilts. Now, since we're limited in space here, I'm not able to bring one of those beautiful handmade quilts. So close your eyes for just a moment and try to envision one. Let me take that back. Don't close your eyes. Many of you are in recliner rockers. Just go ahead, keep your eyes open, and try to think through this if you would. And if you picture a beautiful handmade quilt, you will find that, uh, quite frankly, one that is well done is a very valuable item. It's handmade. It's designed by an individual. It's cut. The pieces of cloth that come together are cut from uh, different pieces, uh, different sizes, different materials, different colors, but each one of them is cut down and shaped into into a mosaic of beautiful harmony that becomes that particular quilt. To extrapolate from that or to use that as a foundational point, in a sense, God is making us, you and me together, into a beautiful quilt of various cloth, Various textures, various sizes, various colors, but all tied together to make one thing, the church of God, the body of Christ. Now, in a a quality quilt, each piece of cloth 
had to be cut. It had to be reshaped. It had to be sewn into the whole without each piece losing its intrinsic uniqueness. When it becomes the quilt, as you look closely at it, each one of those pieces by itself has its own character, its own quality. It stands out, but it fits within that frame. Remember when Don and I were married, the two congregations where we were, we didn't know they were doing it, but they got together and they made a quilt for us. It was a, for a king-size bed. It was huge. And what they had done was, and it was presented there on our wedding day, and we were, quite frankly, taken back by, by it, knowing what all must have gone into it. If you can picture this huge blanket, and there were individual squares that had been passed out to members of the church, and they were asked to please make your square unique to you. It has to be this size. Don't make it bigger than that. It has to be this size, but you put on what you want to. And as they gave us that uh, beautiful quilt, we looked at it and we could see, well, well, Nancy did this one. Hazel did that. Jeannie, she's the one who did that piece and on down the way. And it was a huge blanket and it was beautiful together. But as you look closer, it was obvious to us who made each individual square, but it all fit together. Now, for the Church of God, a worldwide association, to accomplish that great work that God has set before us, we must be willing to live within the borders of the quilt. Still unique, still our own color, still our own ability, still our own statement, but we have to fit within the boundaries of that church into which we have been called for that church, God's church, to be able to accomplish that which is set before us. Now, let's go back for a moment to that Jamestown settlement. And in the United States, uh, we have, have had as our motto and is written on our currency is the motto E Pluribus Unum which is out of many, one. And that's been the motto of our country beginning out, and it's also on our currency. So looking at the founding of the, what became the United States, from the incipients of the United States, from the Jamestown settlement, to the writing and signing of the Declaration of Independence, to the discussion in Constitution Hall and the signing of the Constitution, had it not been for the coalescing of those men, those individuals who were involved in that, them of such diverse background and thought. They had to coalesce into one group, one sense of purpose for them to come together and write that constitution for this nation to go forward, for this nation to become the singular nation that it is. That would have never happened, that opportunity to become a nation, if it had not been that those individuals who had their own perspective, their own background, their own purpose, their own individual wants and desires and challenges, to set those things aside and come together and agree upon the work that they would do through the laws that were being set up. Now, you and I know God had his hand in all of that. But if you look at that just on the physical plane, what they had to do for them to come together. Now, the Church of God, a worldwide association, will continue to grow, and it will continue to be blessed to the degree that we as an individual and we as a part of the group yield to God, yield to His government, and yield in the spirit of humility— now, just thinking back, and if you would think on this as well, here's a small portion of what we have been taught during our tenure in the Church of God. That instruction which we have been taught has been underscored through our own personal experiences, as they say, where the rubber meets the, the road, what we have been taught and then how we apply it. We have been taught from the Bible and the teaching from the Bible through the work of the church or the instruction of the church, we've been taught the laws of God. We've taught the, been taught the 
um, government of God, the application of God's love. Uh, We are taught the way of God's life or the way of life that God has given us, and we live it. We are taught what sin is, and we're instructed to eschew evil. We learn to take responsibility for our own actions. We learn to esteem others better than ourselves. That's just a portion of what we have been taught. For probably most of us, that's a different approach to life. Well, I think it is for all of us a different approach to life. But it's the new life. It's the new way to walk. It's what God has called us to do. It is the fruit of having that training from the Bible being preached in our ears, reading copy based upon Scripture, Scripture itself. That's what we apply. That's what we have. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, and then notice verse 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And it continues at that same thread. But notice verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. We members of God's church are unique. We are, by definition, different from one another. We're scattered around the world as evidenced by this telecast or this Sabbath service that's going around the world today. Yet we are to blend together. We are to become the same overall, but still retain our uniqueness. We are to keep our strengths. We are to keep our talents, but we are to whittle away chip away, sand down the areas that keeps us from coalescing into the whole. If I may hearken back to that gift that Don and I received, that that quilt, for it to fit each one, each section, if I remember, was like six inch square. One might have had a whole bunch of stuff that they wanted to put in there and all, but they had to bring it down. Others may not have been as creative. Maybe they just had enough to put a little dot, uh, being exaggerating, but then they had to expand. So what they put was unique, but it fit within the whole. Notice, if you would, in Matthew chapter 5, part of that intimate teaching by Jesus Christ, and this is a very brief statement, but so powerful. It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You and I must become meek. Meek does not mean weak. Meek sounds like weak, but it is a total, totally different thing. The Greek word that is translated meek means strength under control. And referring to horses, strong and powerful, yet under control. In Old English, they use the term called to meek a horse or to make a horse meek, to be able to take a horse and make it useful for their purpose. It is as the breaking of a beautiful and strong and independent and powerful wild stallion, wild stallion, excuse me, that stallion becomes a horse when it is made meek. It has the same power, it has the same strength, but now it's channeled into a productive use. To be of value to man, that wild stallion has to be transitioned to a meek and teachable horse of strength. You and I, we need to follow that same pattern to be of service to God. Keep that strength, keep that ability, accept the challenge but become meek so that God can use you with me. Why did God call you and why did God call me? There is a, there is a talent, there is an ability, there is an experience in us that God desires to use according to his purpose. Each one of us has something to offer. 
God saw that, and God saw a person who would be able to respond to that calling and not allow the the winds from Satan to derail us or the dry ground, etc. But we would be loyal to God. The main point of this sermon is to show that God uses people of various abilities and backgrounds to do the same job, to achieve the same goal, and that is to do the work of God as he reveals it. Brethren, rather, wherever you are, South Africa, Central Africa, New Zealand, the Philippines, the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, the Caribbean, wherever you may be, God is weaving a beautiful quilt of many colors. Use your strength. Use your texture. Use your color. Use your abilities to make it a quilt that God is pleased with. So now for the conclusion, the conclusion of this sermon is its title, E Pluribus Unum, Out of Many, One. 